what interested you in this particular topic? John and a team were interested in making a number of films about conflicts. I had been many years, ever since 1972, working very directly as mediator, as interpreter, as reconciling type in many conflicts like Northern Ireland, like Middle East, not only Israelis, Palestinians, but uh, uh, Lebanese, sometimes Syrians, sometimes Egyptians. For a long time, the Kurds in, the, uh, in Iraq and in Turkey eventually. And I'd been all over the, Balt uh, the Baltic countries as they had their wars and many others. And we got into making films for a number of years, we took the BTI, the Boston Theological Institute, that's the consortium of our theology schools in the whole region, on summer workshops. And the first few times, uh, John and his film crew came along with that. And we got in the habits, so we did it with or without them. <laughs> How did you come to collaborate on this book? Well, I had been working on issues dealing with fascism and the Holocaust uh, starting in 1970. And then in 1980, I got very much interested in the Holocaust film. And that led to an interest in genocide. So uh, Ray and I decided we would teach a course focused on genocide. So we offered that two years ago, year before last. And then we decided we would do it again uh, using this book that we just published. So we have a much more narrow focus with genocide, or maybe a larger focus with genocide, but still with that central issue of the Holocaust as a prime analogate. Had you worked together before? Well, John and I have collaborated on a lot of things. We have been making films together over quite a long time, I think the first one was 1997, on conflict situations. And, all right, we had actually given a course which has a book attached and a box of uh, DVDs on our own conflict films. And a course on genocide really appealed and that a book came out of it after the first time we gave the course we gave the course again this year, this last year, being able to use the book. Was this a difficult topic to research and teach? Well, I'll tell you, for myself, I have been working with these issues for so many years. They are right at the surface of my mind all the time. And to talk about them, just to have an opportunity to discuss them with students in class, this was really a relief for me to be able to talk about these. These are topics that you, uh, that people will usually find easy to talk about. Mm -hmm. And to have them the topic of a course where we were seeing the films and the students were reacting in very immediate terms to things that they hadn't found familiar before. And very immediate reactions, uh, all the, the shock and horror, uh, was there in the class, even say, we started the course with the American Indians. Mm -hmm. We've been very efficient in this country at wiping them out. And for people to realize that, and realize that when John and I were growing up, we used to go Saturday afternoons to a double header at the movies, and they'd usually be cowboys and Indians films, and the, uh, the spirit of it was the only good Indian is a dead engine. <laughs> this was genocide. We started making documentary films in 1990, uh, starting with the Holocaust, and then it emerged uh, or merged into our conflict resolution films, which we made uh, nine of them over the past uh, 10 years or so. And the Holocaust uh, has been a focus in much of my work. And the first one I did with the help of, you know, many individuals here from the former audiovisual uh, area, uh, now Media Tech Services, we did a film dealing with Christian anti-Semitism. 
And that was a focus, the material was a focus for my whole chapter dealing with the Holocaust in the genocide book. And when we were editing the film, I brought the whole studio home <clears throat> and seeing the uh, my children who were at that point in the 1990s, you know, young, maybe five or six, and seeing the children in the film being led to the gas chambers was very, very excruciating. I remember being very upset and the editor, a young woman, uh, was also very, very upset by this. And I, you know, I tried to distance myself at some point in trying to be objective in what I'm presenting, but it's still a very, very haunting subject that comes back, I would almost say daily, mm. uh, because I'm so immersed in either writing about it, especially with this new book on uh, film and the Nuremberg trials. but. Uh, I feel that teaching the course, very much like Ray, is a chance to share these ideas with students who have never heard, say, of some of the ethnic cleansing issues dealing with the Serbs and the Croats. What is the significance of the title, Through a Lens Darkly? I was looking for a title that had some kind of resonance to it that maybe even spoke spiritually to this tragedy. The word for Holocaust today is often Shoah, a moral tragedy. And I looked at this uh, work on the genocide as something deeply spiritual uh, that really harmed the collective identity and the soul of a people. And one biblical idea came to me from this idea of through a lens darkly, or through, the original was, through a glass darkly you see. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a reference to how you see God. And the first idea of through a glass darkly meant that it was more opaque. But then in the afterlife, you would see much more clearly. So instead of glass, I introduced the idea of lens to stand for cinema and photography. Would you tell us a little bit about the cover of the book? Well, the statue, it looks as if it must be a Madonna and child. It is not. It is a statue out of the Armenian genocide. It is over in the Armenian Museum in Watertown, and the title of it is Genocide the woman holding this dead child. I know as I have watched the newspapers all the way through Iraq and Afghanistan, I've realized that we're having this picture of Rachel mourning her children. It appears in the newspapers every day. When we uh, went to the museum, you know, we saw the power of this statue that was done by an Armenian artist. And uh, I asked Kerry Burke, who does the photography here at BC, to come over and film it. And she filmed it, and then when I sent it to Peter Lang, I suggested uh, a cover that would have a, a photographic look to it because mm -hmm. of the title, Through a Lens Darkly. But also, as someone suggested, it, it um, brings up an idea of a sniper's mm. uh, lens as well. So yeah. it's twofold, the way they designed it at uh, Peter Lang. I gave them the suggestions and they uh, carried out the graphics for it. Why were these particular essays chosen? Well, do you know, at BC we have a very extraordinary faculty. We have a lot of people who are very deeply involved with these conflicts as sociologists, as historians, as you know, authorities. And a great number of these essays are from our own uh, BC faculty. Didn't limit it there, we went outside where we needed to. And well, we have some very learned people. And we needed to cover both the genocides and the films. So those usually went into separate essays, people who were very expert on either side of this. And the genocide and the film 
uh, were complementary in the course. How do people know about them? Uh, one of the most remarkable things in giving the course was that very often we would bring up a genocide and it was brand new news to our class. They'd never really heard this or had never really concentrated on it. The day we had the whole class over to the Armenian Museum in Watertown, uh, the class were just shocked out of their socks at understanding what had gone on and uh, how devastating it had been for a people. And I think that sort of set the mood for much of the course, that it was a journey of discovery for them to realize just how much of this there has been. Do you know, there have been lots more genocides than things that we've made films about. There were so many genocides. And, uh, you know, if you go back, you have in the 17th century the massacres at Magdeburg. You have many, in the course of the Thirty Years' War, there were genocides all over the place. Uh, if you go back into ancient history, anywhere you go in the Middle East, you find these things they call tells. We probably heard more about Troy and the many layers uh, of the tell, each of which reflects a city that suffered a genocide. And that is so common all over the Middle East. All of these ancient cities, you find 10, 15, 20 layers each of which represents a genocide. The city was simply wiped out and a new one built on top. Well, as Ray was just saying, we chose essays that would reflect the films, but we also um, had selected essays that dealt with the history. So after our introduction and forward, we decided we would have an introductory essay that would describe a history, say, of the Armenian Genocide in 1915, and then we would have essays that would analyze the film and put them into a context of the history. So when we looked at the Armenian Genocide, we looked at a film that was called Everyone's Not Here uh, that describes the uh, genocide from the point of view of the descendants of the, the victims of the genocide. How does film differ from other genres such as literature or art? I think that film is a much more engaging uh, perspective on a genocide only in this respect that you can do research, you can develop uh, a topic and then show it physically and visually perhaps a little like art or photography uh, but there's also an emotion involved in, say, a feature film about genocide. One good example would be uh, Hotel Rwanda, where you see physically uh, the escalation of the genocide. Uh, or in the killing fields of Cambodia, which we treat in the book. And there's a, a connection to the visual image of an audience or a viewer that is maybe much more engaging. Of course, I'm prejudiced, but uh, I believe that that often captures uh, the depth of the emotion when you see a film. I'm writing right now on the Nuremberg trials and how film was used as a physical testimony and a visual testimony uh, at the trials. And Ray had written the foreword, and we had, you know, I had looked at uh, how these films were presented in the court, and they amazed people, they shocked people, they sickened them, especially in a film like Night and Fog by Alain Rene. And then in one film that Hitchcock helped with, uh, Memory of the Camps, the plow scenes moving the bodies at Bergen Belsen. Uh, physically sickened the judges uh, when the film was presented at the Eichmann trial in 1961. They left with ashen faces and uh, shut down the, the court right after that. So there's an emotional content and uh, an experience that I see when film describes a genocide.
Are there further differences between documentary and feature films? Students were all very uh, much at odds with each other over which were the more important kinds mm -hmm. of record of a genocide. The feature film has all kinds of emotional impact. I know we have done enough documentary films between us. We always have a musical background, consistent, and we get good ones. And the musical background is going to be a guide, an emotional guide. Uh, the documentary film puts you much more immediately into the context of actual people. You're not dealing with actors, but the actors can be very, very good. One of the most extraordinary things I've found, uh, we've been in the habit of posing a question after every class and the students all respond to it. Uh, usually John will uh, come up with the film questions, I'll come up with the genocide questions. And in this case, I decided to give him a film question and asked him about the musical background, what to do. And most of the students had to go back and watch the film again because the musical background had just not been a conscious part of how they received the film, but it was a very strong emotional part. What resources did the library provide? Well, it started out with the course itself. We asked the library to purchase many films that were sometimes not even on the market. They had to go to individual directors. So we were able to get the films for the course. We saw them in the course itself. Uh, and we were able to you know, get someone to write specifically about a film and we had it handy. So that was the first step. The second step was to get research materials dealing with each of these situations, like the ethnic cleansing in the Balkans and um, the uh, issues that dealt with the Armenian genocide. So we did not have some of these resources, so the library purchased those books. And then lastly, uh, I would come up with uh, some type of historical uh, fact or date that had to be uh, documented and uh, authenticated. So I would often use that resource, ask a librarian. Mm -hmm. And once, uh, you know, once I sent the question, probably within a day or so, I would have an answer and then I would usually follow it up with, you know, is there anything else on this topic that would be helpful? So I gathered a lot of information simply by going to the computer and ask a librarian. And sure enough, I would get you know 99% of these answers. And then the databases that were procured by the library were very, very helpful. Um, you know, when I was working on uh, some of the issues dealing with the Holocaust, uh, some of the, the references uh, even back to World War II and Churchill. Uh, we had a database, you know, at that point dealing with Churchill. And I was getting more information about, you know, the British perspective on the Holocaust and so on.